He was born Gilbert de Mortier de Lafayette, a direct descendant of bold French knights who fought in the Crusades and alongside Joan of Arc. During the American Revolution, he became one of George Washington's most trusted commanders. Much more than comrades in arms, the two were like father and son. The moment Lafayette saw Washington, he looked at him and he said, that's the man I want to be like. Lafayette was an inexperienced 19-year-old when he arrived in America. Within five years, he would become skilled in both conventional and guerrilla-type tactics and would play an important role in the critical Patriot victory at Yorktown, the battle that ultimately won the revolution. He had a kind of sense of destiny, and he was willing to take risks and not worry. The Marquis de Lafayette, next on Washington's Generals. August 25th, 1777. A British army under the command of General William Howe has landed about 45 miles from Philadelphia, the capital city of the Patriot cause. As the British advance, George Washington sets his defensive lines along Brandywine Creek, one of the last physical barriers between the invading British army and the capital. Philadelphia was the informal capital of the American Revolution. It was where Congress was meeting. It was where the Declaration of Independence was signed. And General Howe hoped that taking Philadelphia would be the means to victory. Howe thought of Philadelphia as being like London. If you captured London, you took Britain. If you took Philadelphia, you took America. With a holding force threatening to cross the Brandywine and attack Washington, the main British force circled around and came in behind the Americans. Alongside Washington that day was a young Frenchman who had volunteered for service in the Continental Army. His name was the Marquis de Lafayette, and although his military skills were untested, he held the rank of Major General. Lafayette, I doubt if he actually tugged on Washington's sleeve, but he pestered Washington so much, saying, let me go into battle, let me go into battle, let me just go out there and fight. Finally, Washington, just to get rid of him, because he was trying to get, trying to talk to his other officers, said, okay, go ahead. Lafayette rode into the center of the battle, at precisely the spot where British troops were concentrating their heaviest fire. The Continentals were coming undone in the face of the furious attack panic-stricken into a frenzied retreat. Lafayette actually threw himself into the fight and tried to rally these American troops with whom he could hardly communicate because remember his English is still very poor at this point but he stood his ground. Finally he got off his horse to rally them and these men rallied around Lafayette and he finally got them regrouped so that they could retreat in order uh, back to, to the safety of the woods. Who was this impetuous, daring young Frenchman? Why was he risking his life for Washington and the American cause? Some of the answers can be found in his distinguished lineage. Lafayette was a man born and bred to be a warrior. He belonged to one of the wealthiest families in France. When Lafayette was just two years old, his father was killed by the British in the Seven Years' War. It was a painful loss that would help shape Lafayette's destiny. From the time I was eight, he would write in his memoirs, I longed for glory. Lafayette was very aware of the military traditions in his family. He was very aware of the noble tradition of service to the king and of military uh, action. And so I think that was an influence on him. From an early age, he wanted to make a mark in the world. And he believed that the military was the way a man of his class could do that. For the impressionable young nobleman with a thirst for glory and the military in his blood, the American Revolution became both a quest and a calling. Lafayette was not the only French officer to embrace the revolution, but he was one of the most prominent. Early in 1777, Silas Dean, the American representative in Paris, granted the persistent young Frenchman a commission as a major general in the Continental Army. Lafayette was just 19, had never commanded troops in the field, had never faced hostile fire. 
He didn't even speak English. Nevertheless, he set sail for his destiny in America, despite the fact that his own king had ordered him not to go. As an officer in the French army, he would have moved up in the ranks. He was assured of a safe and secure uh, career. In giving all that up, he was taking a risk that's very hard to imagine how a 19-year-old boy would make that decision, because he was really almost a boy. In the summer of 1777, Lafayette arrived in Philadelphia to present his military commission to Congress. And Lafayette arrives at the Congress and says, here I am, I know you're going to be pleased, I'm here to join the Continental Army. And the Congress at that point was very skeptical of these French volunteers who had been streaming into Philadelphia now for quite a few months. And they basically said, sorry, we don't need any more French officers. They weren't impressed by the fact that he had a promise of a commission from Silas Dean in Paris. Lafayette was unshaken by the cold reception. As it turned out, the young Frenchman had a friend in high places. Ben Franklin, by this point, had gone to Paris. So a letter arrived shortly after Lafayette arrived in Philadelphia. It said, Lafayette is very well connected. You need to pay attention to this young man. He can help us. And people at the Congress uh, immediately got more interested in Lafayette. But it was more than Lafayette's stature and his royal connections that impressed members of Congress. The difference with Lafayette was that they became convinced of the genuineness of his commitment to the American cause. Unlike everyone else in the, who fought in the war at that point, he was the only one who stood to gain nothing economically or politically. On July 31st, 1777, an act of Congress granted the Marquis de Lafayette an honorary commission in the Continental Army at the rank of Major General. That same evening, the fatherless French officer would meet the father of the American Revolution for the first time. It was the beginning of an intense, enduring friendship, one that would help change the course of the war. Lafayette was just 13 years old when he joined the King's Black Musketeers, the same regiment that would be immortalized in the timeless novel, The Three Musketeers. July 31st, 1777, Philadelphia. George Washington is in the capital to make plans against the impending British attack. At a well-known local tavern, he takes time for a late supper with a few members of Congress. When the Marquis de Lafayette is presented to Washington, there is an obvious rapport. What Lafayette did immediately in his conversation with Washington, he said, I've come here to learn from you and from the American army. I'm not here as a teacher, I'm here to learn from the American Army. And this made a great impression on Washington because all of the other foreigners who had been coming from Europe came with the idea that they were going to teach the American Army what they needed to do to be a good army. The bond between the two men was almost instantaneous and went far beyond Washington's admiration for Lafayette's humility. The moment Lafayette saw Washington, he already was his hero. And he looked at him and he said, that's the man I want to be like. That, that was the, the father he had always fantasized. And Washington saw Lafayette and said, that's the son I've always wanted. Someone who wants to be a soldier. And from the beginning, there was something that happened between the two of them. And other people noticed it as well. They said, there's something unusual about the affection that General Washington feels for this young Frenchman. Evidence of this special relationship would become apparent when Washington asked Lafayette to attend a council of war with his top generals to plan the defense of Philadelphia. A few days later, Washington reluctantly sent Lafayette into the Battle of Brandywine Creek, where he helped rally the Patriot troops into an orderly retreat. But the young Frenchman would not escape unscathed. His first taste of combat was very nearly his last. 
In this struggle, he was shot in the leg and immediately began to bleed, and others recognized that he had been wounded. But it was typical of Lafayette at this point to try to show that he was a courageous volunteer for the cause, and he refused to leave the battle until the troops themselves pulled back from the fight. Washington heard of Lafayette's courage under fire, heard of Lafayette's wound, and was at Riverside when they were loading the wounded onto various barges to sail them upriver to Philadelphia. And he saw Lafayette being loaded on a barge and went to the doctor and said, take care of him as if he were my own son. I think what Washington meant by that was that Lafayette was from a very important French family and if he died at this point in his career it would be very bad for the American cause. So I think when he says treat Lafayette as if he is my son he means give him the best care you possibly can and don't treat him as just another member of the ranks. Although Lafayette had shown courage at Brandywine Creek, the Americans lost the battle and the British soon took Philadelphia. After another defeat at Germantown a few weeks later, Washington went to winter quarters in Valley Forge while Lafayette recuperated from his wound. Throughout his convalescence, Lafayette took time to write home. In correspondence with his wife and family, he apologized for the royal embarrassment caused by his departure. He also extolled the virtues of the Continental Army and the Revolution. He began writing letters back to France, explaining that these were good soldiers, that this was a noble cause, that this was an opportunity for France to make a contribution not only to America, but perhaps to its own interest, which was to reduce the power of the British Empire. And so, in his letters to his family, in his letters to the French government officials whom he knew, he began to argue, this is a cause France should support. The young nobleman who had left France against the king's wishes was now starting to influence its foreign policy. When news of the British surrender at Saratoga reached Paris, the king was finally moved to act. In December, Benjamin Franklin was received at Versailles, and France soon recognized the United States as an independent nation. The French were looking for a way to weaken the British Empire. Their public claim was that they were helping the people of America gain their freedom. Behind closed doors, what the French government officials were really hoping to do was to strike a blow at the British Empire. Meanwhile, Lafayette was also writing letters to George Washington, begging for his own command. Consider, if you please, that Europe, and particularly France, is looking upon me that I want to do something by myself and justify that love of glory which I let be known to the world. Washington responded favorably to Lafayette's appeal and asked Congress to give him command over a division of the Continental Army. On December 1st, 1777, Congress granted Washington's request. Washington gave Lafayette a field command. Uh, and uh, many of the other uh, officers uh, were a little skeptical of Lafayette to begin with. And in fact, many of these officers became lifelong friends of Lafayette later on. Now I would say with that officer corps around Washington being convinced of Lafayette's competence to handle this job, even though a very, very young man, again shows that Lafayette was a remarkable soldier. By the end of 1777, Lafayette had been in America less than six months. He had fought with distinction and been seriously wounded in action. Still just 19, Lafayette now commanded a full division of Patriot troops and was a favorite son of George Washington. The foundation for Lafayette's legend had been laid, but the events of the next few months would test the young general in ways that he never imagined. Throughout the United States, from Maine to California and Minnesota to Louisiana, there are 44 cities or counties named in honor of the Marquis de Lafayette. 
Winter, 1778. At Valley Forge, Pennsylvania, George Washington's battered army is struggling to survive in the face of hunger, disease, and deprivation. With the British Army in control of both New York and Philadelphia, any hope of a patriot victory seems remote. A few in Congress and the military began to ask whether George Washington should remain as Commander-in-Chief of the Continental Army. A plot is hatched to replace him. It is called the Conway Cabal, after General Thomas Conway, one of Washington's harshest critics. The conspiracy will prove to be a defining moment for both Washington and Lafayette. When the group of generals and members of Congress who were involved tried to enlist Lafayette, Lafayette took the bold step of going to their meeting and when uh, a toast was given to Congress after everyone was rising to give the toast Lafayette interjected and to General Washington which of course then put everybody in a very difficult situation of continuing with the toast. In a sense this was a turning point for Lafayette because he made it clear from that point on that he was George Washington's man no matter what might happen. And Washington knew that. He knew about the Conway Cabal and when he understood that Lafayette was his supporter, it deepened the relationship between Lafayette and Washington. Support for the Cabal soon disintegrated. And the spring brought new hope. Fresh troops were pouring into Valley Forge, and the Treaty of Alliance with France had been finalized. Soon, Congress was pressuring Washington to retake Philadelphia. In May, he ordered Lafayette and a force of light troops to observe the British and harass them whenever possible. Washington urged Lafayette to keep moving, and specifically warned him against setting up any stationary positions that might become a tempting target. To the British, it would have had great symbolic meaning to capture this young Frenchman, partly because it would have humiliated his family, partly because it would be a way of showing that no one was safe from the British Army. So they had a great desire to get Lafayette, who had become more than a general. He had become a symbol of French-American relations. Ignoring Washington's warning, Lafayette set up a stationary position on the very first night of his mission. Barren Hill lies halfway between Valley Forge and Philadelphia and seemed to Lafayette perfectly defensible, offering good views of any attacking force and well protected by the steep cliff running down to the Schuylkill River. When British Commander William Howe received word of Lafayette's position, he sent 8,000 troops to trap him. Hal was just chomping at the bit with the idea and in fact he writes to some of his officers now we're gonna get the boy as they called him and the idea of you know holding Lafayette uh, uh, as, a, as a hostage he, he was just so exuberant that he sent out a huge force Lafayette was soon surrounded on three sides by British troops the sheer cliff that he thought would protect him now trapped him against the river Rather than surrender to the odds, Lafayette hatched a clever plan. In a sense, I believe he thought he would escape. He had a kind of sense of destiny. He talked about having a star. And he was willing to take risks and not worry. When Lafayette realized that he was caught between uh, converging British columns, um, to the amazement, I think, of almost everyone there, he keeps his head. He doesn't panic, even though a lot of his troops are getting very nervous. He decides to put on a bold front. What he'll do is he will give the appearance of putting up a fight. He sent little squads of two or three men to the edge of the wood, step out from the trees and fire at the British, and step back into the trees and disappear. All of these little teams darting in and out around the perimeter of the wood gave the British the impression that there was a huge force in there, much larger than they had anticipated. So they backed away from the woods and took positions ready for a, an all-out battle. With Howe convinced by the cunning illusion, Lafayette efficiently moved his troops down the cliff face and across the river. <laughs> 
Lafayette's men escaped down to the river and across the river, and soon they pulled back the snipers. They escape, and the British keep firing. They move in closer, they start, they hear guns, and suddenly the commander realized they were firing at each other. This trickery enabled Lafayette to get all of his troops out of there without losing an army that was in a very exposed position. And when he did that, Washington had a new respect for his ability to think creatively in a jam. It's a skillful maneuver and as brilliant an extrication of a, of a trap force as any you can find in the annals of the revolution. Lafayette was proving himself a skilled commander, willing to shift tactics and improvise when necessary. In America, he had found the perfect war and the perfect army for his talents. Lafayette had two uh, very fine instincts for a good leader. One was to listen to people. Uh, the other was to trust them. Now, here were a group of farmers who didn't know anything about warfare as it was fought in, in Europe. Lafayette now had listened enough to his men to realize that European warfare was not valid under these conditions. Lafayette became receptive to what we would call maybe the tactics of guerrilla warfare, willing to make something as unconventional as an attack on the rear guard, willing to campaign in the winter, looking for ways to move quickly at night, strategies that were not common in European armies, but that could work in America. With the British still occupying Philadelphia, the importance of the new American alliance with France became clear. The French were now providing Washington with weapons, munitions, troops, and warships. Fearing that the British army might be trapped in Philadelphia by a French naval blockade, London ordered its commanders to withdraw. The British retreat from Philadelphia is a major undertaking and very risky for the British. It possibly presents Washington with his best chance early in the war to defeat the British. General Washington called a council of all his generals and said, would it be appropriate to take action? Some of the generals, General Lee, for example, said, I think we should be careful about doing something. Lafayette said, this is an opportunity. I think we should strike. Washington compromised by following the British convoy at a safe distance to see what might develop. After a steady rain turned the roads into a muddy bog, the British convoy ground to a halt near Monmouth Courthouse, New Jersey. Washington decided to take advantage and attack. General Charles Lee led the assault on the British rear guard, but it was so disorganized that the element of surprise was lost, giving the enemy time to prepare a defense. Lee conducts this, this poorly coordinated probe with a variety of brigades against the British rear guard. And when the British turn around, he starts pulling some units back. And other units who haven't received orders from him see their comrades retreating, and they start retreating. It becomes kind of like a spontaneous kind of thing. And Lee, instead of trying to, to bring any order out of this, just kind of goes along, goes drifting to the rear. When Washington arrives with his own charge, he collides head-on with Lee's retreating troops. Now furious, Washington desperately attempts to rally his own troops and turn Lee's around. Here's Washington coming up with the rest of his army and expecting uh, Lee to have made contact with the enemy in some sort of firefight that he can join. And he sees units passing him and troops acting like they're beaten. And he gets infuriated. He finally gets to Lee and he asks him, what, the, what is the meaning of all this? And, and Lee, uh, according to eyewitnesses, is only able to stammer, sir, sir, and Washington orders him to the rear and takes over himself. With Washington in command, the Continentals regrouped and stood firm against repeated British counterattacks. The battle essentially ended in a draw. And when night fell, the entire British force quietly slipped away. Lee's failure to execute apparently angered Lafayette as much as it did Washington. Lafayette, as he saw this opportunity to hit the British rear guard, believed this was the kind of risk the American army had to take. They had to do something unconventional.
Unfortunately, General Lee did not have the same kind of imagination, did not realize the same kind of opportunity, and in fact, Lafayette suspected that Lee secretly had a kind of sympathy for the English, or at least he wanted to set up a situation where there would be a negotiated settlement rather than a decisive military victory. With the winter approaching, Washington urged Lafayette to return to Paris. The first attempts at French-American military cooperation had not gone smoothly. Washington realized the alliance needed to be strengthened. He wanted Lafayette to go back to the French court and press for increased support. Lafayette was the most persistent negotiator the Americans could have ever asked for. He repeatedly told the king and his ministers, you need to send more support, you need to send men, you need to send weapons, and the Americans can win the war. While Lafayette worked hard to advance the American cause, his own life moved forward as well. On Christmas Eve, 1779, his wife gave birth to their first son. Perhaps not surprisingly, the child was named George Washington Lafayette. The following spring, Lafayette would return to America and his mentor, George Washington. Together, they would challenge the most formidable military power on Earth. Lafayette may be the only foreigner who has the distinction of dining alone with each of the first seven presidents of the United States. September 20th, 1780, Hartford, Connecticut. George Washington meets with the Supreme Commander of French Forces, Lieutenant General Rochambeau, for the first time. Lafayette serves as translator. Lafayette was the only commander who could speak both languages fluently at that point. Uh, Washington couldn't speak any French, and Rochambeau couldn't speak any English. So you needed someone in between, and someone uh, at a high enough level that could understand the overall battle plans was aware of what was going on and could talk intelligently. As the talks proceeded, Washington was disappointed to learn that Rochambeau was not yet prepared to commit his troops. We should never forget that at this point, the possibility of American success was still very far-fetched. And so while the French were willing to join in the venture, they were still not willing to commit themselves completely to it. Rochambeau was very cautious. He didn't want to take any action yet. He thought they needed more troops, they needed more supplies, they needed more time to recover from the journey they had made from France. Lafayette was pushing for more immediate military action. At the conclusion of the two-day meeting, Washington and Rochambeau signed a joint resolution that laid out guidelines for the prosecution of the war. The resolution also called on the King of France to provide additional ships and troops to America. In the meantime, Washington received a steady stream of bad news from the southern colonies. British General Lord Cornwallis was leading a ruthless campaign through the Carolinas towards Virginia. The possibility that the British might actually capture Virginia was just too much of a horror to the Americans to let that pass unquestioned. So the initial reports of the arrival of British troops required the dispatch of a uh, force. During the ensuing fall and winter, Washington finally received word of two important patriot victories in South Carolina. First at Kings Mountain, and then at the Cowpens. Still to come was the Battle of Guilford Courthouse in North Carolina, where the Continentals would fight Cornwallis to a stalemate. With the British weakened, Washington sensed opportunity. He ordered Lafayette and three light infantry regiments from New York to Virginia. Lafayette's task was daunting. Defend against British raiders then roaming the state, as well as prepare for the possible advance from North Carolina of Lord Cornwallis. So poor Lafayette is facing something like 8,000 8, British soldiers, and he has this small force of Continentals, so he is in a kind of cat-and-mouse situation. 
Uh, he's going to try to appear to be the cat, but he's facing a really big mouse. On April 30th, Lafayette and his soldiers would be tested. A British force has massed for an attack on Richmond, Virginia. As he had at Barron Hill, Lafayette spread his troops very wide, creating the illusion of a much larger army. Rather than launching a full-scale frontal assault on the advancing British troops, he withdrew in a kind of rearguard action, refusing to engage them in a heads-up battle. But by doing that, Lafayette protected his troops in, in a strategy that's very typical of modern guerrilla warfare. He realized that the most important thing for his army was to keep it intact and in the, in the field. There were several uh, arms depots, ammunition depots, and Lafayette orders all of that stuff taken into the hills and uh, hidden uh, to keep it from getting to the British. So when the British forces now pull together and are, it's obvious they're going to drive him out, uh, he simply retreats out of Richmond and leaves them a ghost town. Near the end of May, Lord Cornwallis and his southern army arrived in Virginia. By some accounts, Cornwallis went after Lafayette with a vengeance. Cornwallis's troops outnumbered Lafayette, probably two or three to one. But that meant Cornwallis had to move with very long lines of supply. He had a very cumbersome style of getting his army around. Lafayette's troops, on the other hand, could move quickly. He had, he had cavalry, and he could interfere in a harassing way. Little by little, Lafayette pulls farther and farther north. And with each retreat, he leaves a couple of snipers behind to pick off the first of the British advance men. And little by little, these snipers begin to terrorize the British troops. No one wants to be in the vanguard. They know the first ones out are going to die and not even see who killed them. Bullets are just going to come out of the trees somewhere. Nevertheless, Cornwallis remained focused on his mission in the south. But some believe he also became obsessed with the Frenchman. There are any number of times when Cornwallis tries to use this troop advantage to capture Lafayette. You see, again, the British officers have almost this obsession with capturing the boy. And he has so many more troops that Laf than Lafayette. Lafayette really has mastered this ability to, uh, to, to run and hide. On June 10th, Patriot reinforcements under the command of Mad Anthony Wayne joined Lafayette at the Rappahannock River. Around the same time, Cornwallis broke off his advance and began to march towards the coast. Lafayette followed, close behind. I think Lafayette's pursuit of Cornwallis in the Virginia campaign was a decisive contribution to the ultimate American victory in the war. If Cornwallis had been able to escape from Virginia, to, to move back into the south, the war might well have continued for a long time because the British could have resupplied his troops, he could have consolidated in South Carolina or North Carolina, and I don't think the war would have ended as quickly as it did. But there was a more powerful force than Lafayette pushing Cornwallis back to the sea, his superior, Sir Henry Clinton. Clinton assumed that Washington was preparing a major attack against his British forces in New York. Clinton ordered Cornwallis to bring his troops to a safe port where they could be shipped north. Lafayette was very aware of the symbolic value of his campaign. He also realized that as Cornwallis withdrew toward the coast, that it would appear that he had Cornwallis on the run. And in certain ways he did, in other ways Cornwallis was just following General Clinton's orders. Lafayette was writing off dispatches, sending word to France, sending word to Washington to give the impression that he had Cornwallis on the run. But General Clinton was not the only commander who believed that the crucial battle of the American Revolution would be fought in New York. Lafayette realized that he had an important role to play in Virginia, but all the time he was there, he was anxious because Lafayette suspected that the big battle was going to take place in New York. So he was always worried that he was going to miss the really big battle. Cornwallis arrived in Yorktown, Virginia on August 3rd and immediately began to build fortifications. 
No one knew it then, but the key battle of the American Revolution was about to commence. And the Marquis de Lafayette would be in the thick of it. An American flag has flown continuously over Lafayette's grave in Paris for more than a century. Even under the Nazi occupation during World War II, the flag was not disturbed. August 1781, Yorktown, Virginia. Lord Cornwallis and the British Army are now stranded on a narrow isthmus between the James River and the Chesapeake Bay. For the moment, Lafayette and his troops must be content to wait and watch. Once Cornwallis arrives at Yorktown, Lafayette just draws his troops up at a respectful distance, watching the various roads leaving that area to keep an eye on Cornwallis and, and to oppose him if he tries to send out patrols or foraging parties and things like that. Although Cornwallis has his back to the sea, he's confident that the British Navy will rescue him. But George Washington and the French General Rochambeau have other ideas. Rather than engage the British forces in New York, they have decided to take on Cornwallis in Virginia. Lafayette was overjoyed because he realized that instead of his missing the battle in New York, he was at the central point for the most important campaign of the war, the moment when the French and the Americans were going to join together in a climatic battle. While Washington and Rochambeau moved their armies south to Yorktown, a French fleet sailed into the Chesapeake Bay. When a British fleet arrived to rescue Cornwallis, 30 French warships were waiting for them. The epic sea battle raged for four days. When it was over, the battered British fleet limped back to New York, and 3,000 French Marines were sent ashore to join Lafayette's forces. The trap was closing around Cornwallis. I think at that moment, when the word reached Cornwallis that that's the situation, he began to realize there was no way out. While the French Navy was driving off the British fleet, Washington and French General Rochambeau were approaching Yorktown with 8,000 American and 5,000 French troops. By the time they arrived in late September, the combined forces under Washington's command would number around 20,000 soldiers. The Americans and the French were very confident by early October that they had Cornwallis exactly where they wanted him. And in that moment, it was a chance for everybody to achieve some glory because there was a great feeling that this was going to be the decisive battle. On October 9th, Washington ordered his artillery to begin the bombardment of Cornwallis's encampment. 5 days later, the Patriot siege is still underway. Lafayette along with another Washington favorite, Alexander Hamilton, is chosen for a special mission. Washington wants to assault two British redoubts so he can move his artillery even closer to the British position. Lafayette has overall command of the operation. While French forces attack redoubt number nine, American soldiers mount a bayonet charge against the British artillery at redoubt number 10. Lafayette will pick 400 chosen light infantrymen to make the assault. And much to his delight, his command will take readout number 10 faster than readout number 9, which is being attacked by French troops. It's a high point for the Continental Army, uh, because at the beginning of the war, uh, the British were the guys who did the dirty work with the bayonet. But the Continentals, they go in, uh, Lafayette orders his troops to attack with unloaded muskets. So they're going to do it with cold steel. They're going to beat the British at their own game. The redoubts are captured within 30 minutes. Three days later, on October 17, 1781, the siege of Yorktown ends. Realizing that the British Navy would never reach him, Cornwallis sends Washington his articles of surrender. He refuses to attend the formal ceremony, however, choosing instead to remain in his headquarters. Cornwallis was humiliated that he had been trapped in part 
by a young French general, but more generally, he was humiliated that this great British army was defeated. When he realized that he could not escape, that the siege was over, he couldn't bring himself to go out and surrender, so he sent other officers out. After all, in his eyes, these were rebels, and this was not a victory of one nation over another. There was no such nation as the United States. Cornwallis sends his sword to the ceremony with his junior officer, General Charles O'Hara. Rather than surrendering the sword to Washington, O'Hara tries to present it to the French commander, Rochambeau. Lafayette was standing next to Rochambeau, and before the British aide could surrender his sword to Rochambeau, Lafayette whispered to Rochambeau what was going on, and Rochambeau then pointed to General Washington as the commander-in-chief to whom this aide would have to surrender his sword. And at least one account suggests that Washington also refused the sword, obviously aware of some intended snub, and pointed to Benjamin Lincoln, who had had to surrender to the British at uh, Charleston. And Lincoln uh, simply returned the sword, which was then returned to uh, Cornwallis. Washington's victory at Yorktown marked the first scene of the final act for the British in America. Throughout the pivotal siege and the long campaign leading up to it, Lafayette had served both Washington and the new nation well. Lafayette's participation in the Yorktown campaign made him a central figure in the iconography of the revolution. And I think to, to some extent it captures the international significance of the revolution and makes it uh, a world event rather than a simply a domestic American event. Here was a major general at one point the third highest ranking officer in the Continental Army who was 19 when he arrived and when he was instrumental in defeating Cornwallis and winning the Battle of Yorktown he was only 24 years old. This is remarkable. I mean, some kids today are still teething at 24. On January 17, 1782, Lafayette returned to Paris wearing the uniform of an American general. His quest was over. The king would later award Lafayette the Cross of Saint Louis, France's highest military honor. I don't think we would have won the war without Lafayette. I think he was the, the key factor, the key uh, human factor in the war. We had to have the intervention of some foreign power. Well, there was only one other foreign power of any consequence, that was France. It's hard to say that the Americans would have lost the revolution without Lafayette. I don't think one could say that. But I do think it's true that without Lafayette or someone like Lafayette, it would have been far more difficult for the Americans to build that alliance with the French. And that alliance with the French, the army, the navy, was in the end the decisive military step that enabled the Americans to win a decisive victory and gain their independence. In 1784, Lafayette returned to America for a triumphant tour, which included 10 days at Mount Vernon, visiting with George Washington. They had a kind of mournful visit, too, because they both felt there was a very good chance they would never see each other again. And this kind of father-son relationship that had developed since 1777 had built a bond between them that made the, the farewell in 1784 extremely painful and when Lafayette left to head up to Boston actually to get to get a ship Washington wrote later and said I watched for a long time and I I, I, I fear I'll never see you again it was a kind of sad farewell so the relationship never really ended it just they never saw each other again on May 20th 1834 the Marquis de Lafayette was laid to rest in a Paris cemetery. When his son, George Washington Lafayette, sprinkled a handful of dirt over his father's casket, he was fulfilling a promise 
Lafayette had once collected soil from Bunker Hill in Boston. The old general's dying wish had been to be buried in the soil of both France and America. <laughs> 